Hello and welcome to a summary of all you need to know about 127 hours between a rock and a hard place, which is an extract taken from the book with the same name, written by Erin Ralston. Now, I'm going to be reading through and explaining the extract as it appears in the Pearson Edexcel International GCSE Anthology, and I will explain the meaning related to this text as well as language devices that Aaron Ralston uses that you need to be aware of, as well as other factors that you need to understand when and if you're writing an exam or a coursework piece related to this extract. So let's get started. Now, of course, remember that this is an extract and an excerpt from his actual novel with the same name. And this novel is an autobiographical account taken from Aaron Rawson's life. So in this first hand account, he describes how a boulder essentially crushed his right hand whilst he was climbing and hiking in a canyon. And he'd not really informed anyone of his hiking plans. So there's a lot of tension. Now, I will go through the extract. However, I'm going to go through it in sections. So I will begin by reading the first three paragraphs as you can see here and then i'll highlight important techniques that you need to be aware of and then i'll do so as we go through the extract so let's begin i came to another drop off this one is maybe 11 or 12 feet high a foot higher and of a different geometry than the overhang i descended 10 minutes ago another refrigerator chalk stone is wedged between the walls 10 feet downstream from and at the same height as the ledge it gives the space below the drop off the claustrophobic feel of a short tunnel Instead of the walls widening after the drop-off or opening into a wall at the bottom of the canyon, here the slot narrows to a consistent three feet across the lip of the drop-off and continues at that width for 50 feet down the canyon. Sometimes in narrow passages like this one, it's possible for me to stem my body across the slot with my feet and back pushing out in the opposite directions against the walls. Controlling the counter pressure by switching my hands and feet on the opposing walls, I can move up or down the shoulder width crevice fairly easily as long as the friction contact stays solid between the walls and my hands, feet and back. This technique is known as stemming or chimneying. You can imagine using it to climb up the inside of a chimney. Just below the ledge, where I'm standing is a chalk zone, the size of a large bus tire, stuck fast in the channel between the walls, a few feet out from the lip. If I can step onto it, then I'll have a nine foot height to descend, less than that of the first overhang. I'll dangle off the chalk stone, then take a short fall onto the rounded rocks piled on the canyon floor. So now how this extract opens is essentially describing in very minute details how he's basically inching his way across this massive canyon and of course across these different boulders and we're getting a lot of detail about this. So the sex trap begins with this simple sentence and essentially this sentence puts us right in the middle of the action. We are in this very steep kind of cliff area with lots of boulders and essentially this really pricks up our interest as readers. Then this demonstrative pronoun, this really engages us. We feel as if we're really there. We can see exactly what he's pointing to. And of course, what he's pointing to is really vast. And this is quite intriguing for us, especially for those of us who don't necessarily have an experience of climbing these very steep places, which can be quite dangerous. Furthermore, he highlights the refrigerator chalk stone ledge and the drop off. And essentially the language that he uses belongs in the semantic field of mountaineering. Again, as I've mentioned, this is really interesting for those of us who don't necessarily mountaineer. However, also this language really shows us that the author Ralston knows his stuff. He's an expert in this. Therefore, he uses jargon related to mountaineering. Furthermore, he uses alliteration to describe and to give us lots of detail about how close these chalk stones are, wedged and walled. Essentially, this really emphasizes the proximity. Furthermore, he uses personification to really give a very detailed account of how the canyon looks. He describes the lip at the drop off, which again gives us a really good visual imagery, especially for those of us who haven't actually climbed a canyon or been to a canyon. Furthermore, he talks about stemming across the slot. And so he uses language which is rich in sibilant sounds using the S sounds, which show and reflect how deftly he himself is slithering through these different areas and it shows his agility. 
Furthermore, the antonyms up and down. This kind of shows how he has to really maneuver in a very complex way this place that he's in, this canyon that he's really climbing through. Furthermore, he uses the adjective shoulder width to show just how narrow these borders are. This is a really skilled kind of work and of course this is showing his talent as a mountaineer. Moreover, he uses the rule of three, hands, feet and back, to talk about how his body is adeptly moving and he's being very deft with his movement and his bodily language as he's going through this canyon. Also, he uses a lot of jargon related to the field of mountaineering and, of course, the present continuous verb stemming and chimneying, which he explains as a technique, ties in again to the work that he does. And again, what this does is it makes us realise that, that he knows what he's doing. He's an expert in this. So we feel somewhat confident that he's going to really scale this canyon and he's going to do it in a really expert way. He then mentions how he, it's like climbing up the inside of a chimney. Now, this is interesting because he's using domestic imagery relating to the house, just a chimney. But what this does is it shows that he is aware that there are some readers who don't necessarily mountaineer. So he uses domestic imagery that's quite vivid and relatable to really describe the sensation of climbing this canyon. Also, he uses a syndeton or asyndentic listing to really speed up the pace of the text and to show how he's really moving across quite deftly. He states, just below the ledge where I'm standing is a chalk stone the size of a large bus tyre, stuck fast in the channel between the walls, a few feet out from the lips. So this syndeton now starts showing that he's really deftly moving. Furthermore, again, he's still using some relatable language, a large bus tyre. So this again makes us have a clear image of what he can see before him. So let's carry on through the passage. Stemming across the canyon at the lip of the drop-off, with one foot and one hand on each of the walls, I traverse out to the chalk stone. I press my back against the south wall and lock my left knee, which pushes my foot tight against the north wall. With my right foot, I kick at the boulder to test how stuck it is. It's jammed tightly enough to hold my weight. I lower myself from the chimneying position and step onto the chalk stone. It supports me but teeters slightly. After confirming that I don't want to chimney down from the chalk stone's height, I squat and grip the rear of the lodged boulder, turning to face back up the canyon. Sliding my belly over the front edge, I can lower myself and hang from my fully extended arms, akin to climbing down from the roof of a house. As I dangle, I feel the stone respond to my adjusting grip with a scraping quake as my body's weight applies enough torque to disturb it from its position. Instantly, I know this is trouble and instinctively, I let go of the rotating border to land on the round rocks below. When I look up, the backlit chalk stone falling toward my head consumes the sky. Fear shoots my hands up over my head. I can't move backward or I'll fall over on a small ledge. My only hope is to push off the falling rock and get my way, my head out of its way. The next three seconds play out at a tenth of the normal speed. Time dilates as if I'm dreaming and my reactions decelerate. In slow motion, the rock smashes my left hand against the south wall. My eyes register the collision and I yank my left arm back as the rock ricochets. The boulder then crushes my right hand and ensnares my right arm at the wrist, palm in, thumb up, fingers extended. The rock slides another foot down the... So I'll stop there and then I'll carry on. So, of course, essentially now this is the turning point of the text. So he's climbing, he's definitely moving, 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 and then suddenly he makes a mistake and a boulder comes and essentially crushes his hands and he's trapped. So, essentially, in the paragraph between lines 20 to 28, as we can see here, he uses language related to the body parts, hand, knee, foot, belly, and this is semantic field of body parts. Essentially what he's doing here by just showing us each of his movements and every part of his body is it's giving us a very vivid image of his movement and how it's shifting around. Furthermore, when he states, I press my back against the south wall and lock my left knee, which pushes my foot tight against the north wall, this declarative sentence initially reassures us we realise, okay, he's really understanding how to go, uh, you know, cross this boulder and he has a good grip. However, the verb and the adverb teeter slightly starts to create some tension. At first we felt reassured, but now we're not quite sure. 
Furthermore, he then personifies the stone which responds to his adjusting grip. Now, this personification makes us feel a little bit afraid. The stone is not supposed to respond. It's not supposed to move when he's moving. It's supposed to stay still. So has he picked the wrong place? Furthermore, he then talks about how there's a scraping quake and this verb increases our sense of tension. We feel like something bad might happen. Moreover, the adverb instantly shifts completely the pace of the text. Arguably, this is Volta, the turning point of the text, because we now realize something bad is going to happen. And then the, the declarative sentence, this is trouble. And of course, this and trouble is alliteration. This makes us realize he is in danger. This is not another routine mountaineering exercise. Something bad is going to happen. Again, the adverb instinctively coupled with instantly shows us that he's moving really quickly. He's reacting really rapidly, but this time he might not be lucky. Furthermore, his mention of the round rocks, this alliteration shows just how treacherous this place is. Also, when he talk, when he looks up, he sees the stone falling toward my head, which consumes the sky. So now this complex sentence essentially slows down the pace of this boulder. It feels like everything is happening in slow motion as we read this and we can see this boulder and we're terrified to see what's going to happen next. Furthermore, the passive sentence, fear shoots my hands over my head. So, of course, fear is the thing that's being given the power. It shows just how instinctive his fear is and how it basically takes hold of his body. He doesn't necessarily have the practice movements that maybe his rational mindset would force him to do. So maybe there's a different way to respond to a falling boulder, but actually now he's just acting on instinct. And of course, when you act on instinct, sometimes that's when you make the worst mistakes. Also, he then uses temporal language. He mentions three seconds, a tenth, and what this does is it actually slows down the pace. Everything is happening, but in slow motion, and we're watching in horror, wondering what's going to happen next. And of course, we're not only watching, we're reading this, but we're feeling utter horror. Furthermore, when he mentions the idea of speed, decelerate, decelerate meaning something slows down, this again slows down the pace. Furthermore, when he says time dilates, basically, again, this slow pace means that time feels like it's stretching as we're reading this. Everything is slowing down, much like how he would probably feel that everything is slowed down around him as the rock and the boulder is heading towards him. Then the simile, as if I'm dreaming, shows that he's almost now in a like trance-like state and we feel a lot of tension. We're, going, we're wondering right now what's going to happen to him. Nobody knows where he is. Might he die? Also, the violent verbs smashes and the yank basically shows just how this rock has really damaged his body. Furthermore, when he states, the boulder then crushes my right hand and ensnares, basically the boulder is personified and it traps him. So he is entrapped, he's ensnared. Also, that when he states the wrist, palm in, thumbs up, fingers extended. This is asyndetic listing, a syndeton. And what this does is it really builds up a gruesome image. So let's carry on. The rock slides another foot down the wall with my arm in tow, tearing the skin off the lateral side of my forearm then silence. My disbelief paralyzes me temporarily as I stare at the sight of my arm vanishing into an implausibly small gap between the fallen boulder and the canyon wall. Within moments, my nervous system's pain response overcomes the initial shock. Good God, my hand. The flaring agony throws me into a panic. I grimace and growl. My mind commands my body. Get your hand out of there. I yank my arm three times in a naive attempt to pull it out, but I'm stuck. Anxiety has my brain tweaking. Searing hot pain shoots from my wrist up my arm. I'm frantic and I cry out. My desperate brain conjures up a probably apocryphal story in which an adrenaline-stoked mum lifts an overturned car to free her baby. I'd give it even odds that it's made up, but I do know for certain that right now, while my body's chemicals are raging a full blood, is the best chance I'll have to free myself with brute force. I shove against the bol large boulder, hewing against it, pushing with my left hand, lifting with my knees pressed under the rock. I get good leverage with the aid of a 12-inch shelf in front of my feet. Standing on that, I brace my thighs under the boulder and thrust upward repeatedly, grunting, come on, move, nothing. 
So when he states then silence, this is a minor sentence because a minor sentence is basically a sentence which doesn't have a verb. So of course, in this case, this sentence shows that everything in the world is freezing. So before this sentence, everything was far slower, temporal shift, as I've mentioned, really slowed down the pace, but now it's slowed down and it's frozen. Also, when he states that his disbelief paralyzes him, now this paralysis is a real contrast to his earlier energetic activity as we were scaling the canyon, going across the boulder and so on. And then when he mentions how he watches the sight of my arm vanishing, this seems almost like a magic conjuration. It's unreal that his arm, which moments before was really powerful, now has disappeared into the boulder there's kind of this magic experience it feels almost like he's having this outer body experience watching his body being stuck in this boulder also when he states good god my hand now essentially this internal monologue he he's almost using a mild expletive expletive is like a swear word so when he says good god my hand this internal monologue shows that he's really shocked and he doesn't know what to do next also, when he describes the agony as flaring, it seems like a flame of pain, which again makes us feel a lot of pain as readers. This is also coupled with when he uses alliteration grimace and growl, and this also shows some animalistic language. Now he's only responding instinctively, almost like an animal, and this is now his animal instincts capturing him, and he's trying his utmost to try and get out because really now it's a fight for his life. Also, the adjective naive shows that he's in denial. He just wants to get free and he doesn't accept that he might be stuck. Furthermore, the onomatopoeia cry makes us feel really desperately sorry for him. We realize that he's completely by himself and no one might hear his cries. Also, he then uses more language that we associate with magic because he talks about his desperate brain, how it conjures up a story. And this language related to magic just shows how desperate and fanciful his wishes are to just escape. Furthermore, he then uses colloquial language to talk about the adrenaline-stoked mum, basically comparing himself to images that he's read in the past of somebody whose child is stuck under a car and they heroically flip the car over and rescue their child. So they're hoping that, or rather he's hoping that just like this individual, he'll be able to just, using just sheer force, um, loosen his arm and come out from the boulder's grip. Also, the italics right now shows just how frantic his thinking is. And when he mentions that he wants to use brute force, again, he's reverting back to his instinct because this is essentially animalistic language. He just is now simply thinking in terms of survival. Also, there's an interesting contrast in pronouns. He talks about I, I show against the large boulder and then this contrast with heaving against it. And essentially this contrast in pronoun I and it creates this David and Goliath scenario. So he's the David and he's fighting against this vast Goliath force, which is the boulder. Also, he then speaks to it almost willing it to leave and the explanatory sentence come on move shows he's really pleading and willing the rock to move and of course the minor sentence nothing highlights how futile his attempts are so by this stage we as readers feel a lot of tension we're really terrified we wonder whether he's actually going to escape and we're really on tenter hooks as we're reading this so that's all when it comes to understanding this passage as it appears in the Pearson Ed Excel International GCSE Anthology. If you found this video useful, do make sure you visit our website, which is www.firstrateteachers.com. There you will find plenty of revision resources to help you on your journey through learning English. Thank you so much for listening.